David's coming to read for us. Exodus chapter 28, verses 31 through 39. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of a habergeon, that it may be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and the bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. Father, we thank for this time we can gather to read and study your word. All these items worn by Aaron represent the perfect righteousness of Christ. Christ bore our judgment on the cross and saved us from our sins. Be with Ken as he preaches the gospel. Amen. During the times that we meet around the Lord's table, we have for some time been going through the Old Testament scriptures looking for pictures of Christ. And when I first started that, I thought, well, we'll just kind of hop, skip, and jump through. But we've been camped down for some time in the book of Exodus, and particularly in these portions of scripture that describe not only the tabernacle, but the priesthood and the sacrifices. And I dare say we could camp here for the rest of our lives and never exhaust what we have here as far as pictures of Christ are concerned. And so here today, in this portion that David has just read for us from Exodus 28, verse 31 down to verse 39, we have, again, a description of the garments of the high priest. If you've been following along, from the beginning of this chapter, you will see that we started all the way back with that initial coat that was made for the priest. And you can see that there were different layers to this high priestly garment, just like as Christ, our representative high priest. There's different layers in the Old Testament that portray his glory and his beauty. There's not one particular thing that you can look at that describes the infinite glory of Christ. And so by way of review in chapter 28 and verse 3 and 4, this is where this journey began. Looking at the garments of the high priests. Here the instruction that the Lord gave to Aaron, he was the high priest and his children they were the ones that the charge of the temple, the charge of the tabernacle this time, were given to him and his sons to ensure that God was worshipped in the way that he should be approached in holiness through a mediator. And that's why here in verse 3 of Exodus 28, Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted. Notice, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. When you consider the intricateness of what it was to make these garments, it wasn't just for anybody. It was one that was filled with the very Holy Spirit that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So here in the Old Testament, Aaron was that representative high priest but forward-looking to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's high priest. And it says, these are the garments which they shall make. So nothing was left to 
imagination or to supposition or speculation or change in any way. He said, these are the garments which they shall make. And why was it necessary that it be so specific? It's because every detail pertained to the Son of God. Imagine that you hired an artist to paint a picture of your child. And an artist decides to take liberties that when they finished and they bring it back to you, you look at it and wonder that, well, that doesn't look like anything like my son. Or why did you take this liberty versus what you did here? Nothing was left up to man to determine these things. And the different parts that we've already studied, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat and then a miter and a girdle and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. You can see what these garments represented, the holiness of God. That's why sinners need a mediator because God is holy. <clears throat> I dare say we don't have a clue what that means. We see it written, we read about it, but how holy is God? <laughs> How do you describe his holiness? Well, I know the scriptures say there's no shadow of turning in him. There's nothing but darkness in us. So how is it then that God could ever accept in his presence any sinners? It's not something we take for granted. We know that it's only going to be through that God-appointed and approved mediator, which Aaron was a type, but <clears throat> as all types, they had to go away. They failed. There's only one man that has ever walked this earth who has fulfilled God's law and justice to such a degree as it answered his holiness. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he came, to be that representative. And he wasn't even of the lineage of Aaron. That's how much that lineage failed. That's why the writer of the Hebrews said he came after the order of Melchizedek who had neither beginning nor end. You can't trace any origin with him or ending. What a beautiful picture of the person work of Christ. Melchizedek meaning king of righteousness. And he was from Jerusalem, Salem. He was the, the king of Salem, king of peace. It's only in the Lord Jesus Christ that there's peace, there's reconciliation between God and those sinners that he came to represent. So all of these high priestly garments, the different layers, represent the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if he gives us eyes to see, we're going to rejoice. If he doesn't, we're going to like, ho oh, hum, not another message on the high priestly garments. When are we ever going to get done with this? Well, I hope we never will. And some of you that are artists or designers, you kind of get fascinated with some of this in here more so than me. But it's like Joseph's coat of many colors. It was made for him. And he represented, he was the favored son of his father, for which the other brethren then were jealous. But who's the favored son of God the Father? It is his son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. So as we go through here, this is what we want to look at together. So the very first thing here in Exodus 28 and verse 31 and 32. It says, Thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. So this is the first garment that we want to see. As, as we're going down through it, it started with the undergarment, all being in white. And now it's putting layers on. We're talking about the breastplate, where we saw the Urim and Thummim. These were things that the priest was wearing. So what we're doing is starting with the inside and working to the outer. And here would have been then a robe of blue. And it says there shall be an hole in the top of it. So this was one consistent garment, blue, in the midst thereof at the top. And that it should have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of an harbogen, that it be not rent. 
So it was something that the high priest would put on after he'd put on his white garment over top. He would then place this robe that was blue and it had a hole in it with sewn edges for the purpose of not fraying when it talks that it be not rent. You know how garments are. I know I have shirts in my closet that I love to wear, but when I pull them out and look at them around the neck, it's getting a little bit frayed and I'm kind of looking at it and think, well, can I wear it one more time? Because I like it. But here, think about the situation out in the wilderness and the conditions that these priestly garments would endure and yet the Lord purposed that even in the wilderness, nothing about this garment would ever be frayed or worn. Can you see how that's a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ who came to this earth, came in the flesh, and that nothing that he endured by way of the contradiction of sinners against himself. You talk about a wilderness. There was nothing that frayed at all his garment or wore it down in any way as to lessen its significance and importance. I see this as a picture of his righteousness that he came to accomplish on behalf of sinners. If any part of that righteousness had a frayed thread in it, and I know I'm speaking metaphorically here, then the whole thing would have become unraveled. That's why we have no righteousness. Scripture says all of our righteousnesses, Isaiah 64, 6, are as filthy rags. It doesn't even talk about our sins, all our righteousnesses. Best thing we have to offer is nothing but frayed, filthy rags before a holy God. But his, it had to stand up under every contradiction, every temptation, every trial, so that in the end, God looking upon it would say, there's a righteousness that he could approve. There's a lot in this when you look at it. You say, well, why blue? Well, I don't think it takes a lot of thought to know that blue represents the sky. And here, I believe it speaks of Christ's heavenly authority. Even though here in Aaron, it's represented as a man on earth, Yet as a picture of Christ, it represents his heavenly origin and so defines the character and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came from heaven. He accomplished the work as the high priest that the Father gave him. And where did he return? To heaven. So that's what this blue robe represents. If you look in Ephesians chapter 4, this is the message of the New Testament. We can't study the Old Testament without the New. We can't study the New without the Old. It's one book. But here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10, it says now that he ascended. What is it but that he also descended first? into the lower parts of the earth. When it speaks of the lower parts of the earth, it's talking about his humiliation in coming in this world, being born in a sheep's trough, laid in a manger, the lowest part of the earth. That was his humble beginnings, even though he was king of kings and lord of lords. So we can talk about him ascending up into glory, but what was required first that he should descend into the lower parts of the earth. And verse 10 says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all things that he might fit or might fill all things. The one who descended is the one who ascended. So therefore, the blue here represents that work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once the work was finished, how do we know that it was satisfactory to God the Father. As I said, Aaron was of a priesthood that failed. But Christ didn't come in. How do we know he did not fail? Well, the scriptures tell us, just like here, he would not have ascended. The reason he ascended to be with his Father in that place of glory where he had first originated, the fact he was received is proof that the Father 
had accepted his work. And that's certainly what we read over here in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. When you're thinking of salvation and acceptance before God, don't you dare look at yourself. We have nothing but filthy hands. Don't you dare get looking within thinking, well, am I right enough with God? You'll never be right enough with God. Not with this old depraved flesh. But we look to the mediator. We look to that one who came. As Paul said, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. And he didn't say of whom I was chief. He said of whom I am chief. To his dying breath, he acknowledged that apart from Christ and that work accomplished at the cross, he had no hope. But positively, all his hope, like we sing, all my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. There's days when you get feeling like I'm a little more saved today than I was. That, it has nothing to do with feelings or emotions. It has everything to do with this one who descended, came from above to the lowest part of the earth to save the worst of sinners, and then having accomplished the work, ascended into glory. That's how we know the work was accomplished. Here in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of the Hebrews says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, don't be thinking in terms like you hear that there's all these people up there in heaven looking down through the floorboards and they're witnessing everything that we're doing down here. I'll tell you, if they're in heaven, their thoughts aren't upon this earth. Their heart is upon that one who redeemed them and bought them. And they're singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Now here the great cloud of witnesses has to do with Hebrews chapter 11. All these that are named in Hebrews 11, what I call the, the hall of grace, is representing Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all of these that how were they redeemed? How were they saved? Scriptures say there that they all died having this good report through faith, but not having received the promise. Why is that? Because Christ had not yet come. It was when Christ came that, as it says in Hebrews 11 and verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us since the cross, that they without us should not be made perfect, that they without us should not be justified. It was in one place, one time, one sacrifice that all that God has ever saved were saved and justified. It was at the cross. It had nothing to do with any goodness in them, just like it has no, nothing to do with any goodness in us. All the goodness is in Christ. And this is that cloud of witnesses that is in Scripture. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight <clears throat> and the sin which does so easily beset us. Doesn't say the sins which do so easily beset us, but the sin. What's that sin that so easily besets? It's unbelief. It's that eyes off of Christ onto ourselves somehow or onto our works or our will and any way of our own. That is the sin that so easily besets. And I'll tell you, it takes the grace of God to keep our eyes on Christ. Because there's days when we have good days, we're thinking we're a little bit more righteous than other days. And then there's days when we know we're fallen. And so we look to methods or ways to somehow get back into fellowship with God. <clears throat> That's the sin which does so easily beset us. We're not to look to the flesh or to our experience. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do we run? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Our is in italic, so it's not in the original. The author and finisher of faith. Faith has its object. It's Christ. And so to be able to look unto him, he's the author of it. The originator of it. If any of us have faith, been caused to see, it came from Christ. That's his grace. And what? The finisher of it. Those that he has saved, he keeps all the way to the end. 
And it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down where? At the right hand of the throne of God. That's what this robe, this blue garment here that we're reading about in Exodus chapter 28 then represents. Not only him who came from glory, but him who having finished the work for which he came, ascended back on high and therefore he is to be glorified so that's the robe the blue robe that is represented here in Aaron's robe let's come back here now to Exodus 28 and verse 33 remember every detail is significant so you got the blue representing the sky representing the origin of the authority of the high priest but you, you have here now bells and pomegranates. What's that all about? Was this just to decorate the robe or what was it about? <clears throat> here it says that in verse 33, beneath upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and a purple and a scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell, so you can picture this, and then a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And verse 35 gives the explanation. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord and when he cometh out that he die not. You can imagine, especially on that day of atonement, when the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies and it was a day of rest no one was to work as each person stood at their tent door that surrounded this tabernacle and they could hear the sound of the jingling of the bells going in as long as they could hear that sound they knew there was hope they knew that that high priest was before the Lord and all oh, the joy in his coming out to bless the people, knowing that the Lord had for one more year received the sacrifice. Every year that had to be offered, once a year. That was a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ going before his Father on behalf of his people. Not many times, but by his one sacrifice that he offered up, that it was sufficient for the salvation of his people. So what do the bells Represent, I believe the golden bells here because they were bells of gold. It says there in verse 33, what does gold represent? The very holiness and character of God himself. Of all of the precious stones or, or material that you could ever have, gold is used in scripture to describe God. And the sound from the bells ringing out as the high priest served is a, a sound of joy. We, we perhaps have heard that song before sung, Ring the Bells of Heaven. <laughs> there is joy today. <clears throat> well, here in scripture, that ringing of the bells is a symbol of praising God. When the high priest went in before the Lord, not without sacrifice taking the blood in before the holiest of holies yes it was a solemn event but at the time same time a joyous event when i preach to you of christ yes it's solemn when we consider the sufferings that he endured but for the lord's people the joyful sound of the gospel knowing that christ has entered in and come out and he's accomplished that work on behalf of his people over in Psalm 150, and again, remember the Psalms were the hymn book of the church. And so we would expect in these Psalms to see something of what we rejoice in today in the person work of Christ. It's actually all about him. But here's a picture of the ringing of the bells and the praising of God. Notice it says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. That's the word that's used of the temple. 
That's where the worship was offered. That's where the sacrifices were made. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with a psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So here in our text, these bells represent these instruments that God himself purpose should be made of gold. For one thing, to praise and honor him. You say, what's the, what are the pomegranates all about? Well, pomegranates picture here fruitfulness. They say still that the, one of the best things for your heart is to go eat some pomegranates. I don't know if you've ever tried to eat those things. I, I went and cut one up one time. I thought, well, I'm going to just have some pomegranates here. And I cooked them up. First thing I did, and I put it in my mouth, it was like, whoa, this does not taste like I thought it should. But nonetheless, it has always been a healthy fruit. It's always been something that has been for the good of the body. But here, in particular, it describes the fullness and the richness of the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his attributes. And the colors that are described here are all significant. We've seen these colors before. When you look in verse 33, pomegranates of blue, pomegranates of purple, and of scarlet. So you had a bell and then you had a pomegranate. A bell and a pomegranate. Well, what does blue represent? We've already seen that. It talks about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the purple represent? It represents his royalty. That yes, while he was priest, he was also king. That's how he reveals himself. And what does scarlet represent? All throughout scripture, scarlet represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood that he came to sacrifice on behalf of his people. And that's what a high priest was in his garment as he went before the Father. It represented all of these different attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ to the honor and glory of Christ alone. Now, we look at the next item. So we've seen the blue robe along with the bells and the pomegranates. But then now we move on and we have here what's called the holy mitre. In verse 36, thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet. And I love the way the translators put this all in capital letters. Holiness to the Lord. You notice that to this point, we haven't even seen the word love. A lot of people today, that's all they want to talk about. God is love. God is love. How is he love? He can only love in association with his holiness. His love must be a holy love. His love is not just looking the other way in order to save sinners. There has to be a just satisfaction in order for God to love Sinners, that holiness is the primary attribute of God to which all of the other attributes are associated. I remember when the Lord first opened my eyes to Christ in truth. That's, that's what affected me, just like with Isaiah. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the seraphim shouting around the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. I'll tell you, we'll never know the love of God apart from knowing the one who satisfied God's justice, that God might be just to justify. That's how we have to see him. And here we see this holy mitre. And it says in verse 37, thou shalt put it on a blue lace. Again, blue representing divinity or that which is from heaven, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. That's where this, these words would be written. 
and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear. This is an interesting statement. We read it, but stop and see what it's saying. That he may be, bear the iniquity of the holy things. You would think it would say he might bear the iniquity of the sinful things. But here it is bearing the iniquity of the holy things. That word holy means the consecrated things. What that means is that everything about that tabernacle, even though it was a picture of Christ, still had to be sanctified. Because they were earthly, they were being touched by men. Just the fact of the priest taking and putting on that garment, his very hand stained what that garment represented. And so even there was necessary that sacrifice be offered. That's why it says of Aaron that he first of all offered for his own sin and then the sin of the people. There's the distinction then between the work of Aaron and the work of Christ. Because Christ had no sin for which he had to die. That's why he's not of the priesthood of Aaron. That every part of his garment, of his person, was sinless and spotless. But here for Aaron, even the very holy things that he was presenting before the Lord, it was necessary that he bear the iniquity of that, which the children of Israel shall hollow in all their holy gifts. So even in bringing those gifts, there was, there was no sanctification or righteousness in them bringing it. A lot of people like to talk today about how you come before God, and it's all about how and where and when. I'll tell you, none of that can justify us before a holy God. It's how this high priest, Christ, presented himself and bore the iniquity of his people. And the reminder of this, as it says there in verse 38, it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Why the forehead? Well, that's the thoughts. That's where the thoughts come. Christ in fulfilling all righteousness for his people, it wasn't just in word and deed. But in thought. That's why people today say, well, I hope I'm doing well enough. I hope in the end when God comes down to weighing my good deeds versus the bad, that some of my good will outweigh the bad. Well, you're, you're missing a great part of the problem of you being a sinner. It's not just word and deed, but it's thought. This word judges our very thoughts. Our very thoughts condemn us before a holy God. And when you consider that, that causes you to think then there is no hope within myself. But what it required was the high priest, Christ, to come and stand in the place of those sinners that God purposed that he would save. And that in word, deed, and thought, he came not only and fulfilled the letter of the law, but the very spirit of it. See, that's where he condemned the Pharisees because they were arrogant they thought they were keeping the law just like people today think they're keeping the ten commandments <laughs> and that's why i said well you've heard it said as the law said thou shalt not commit adultery but he said i say unto you if you look upon a woman to lust after her you've already committed adultery with her heart well that that brought them to silence in every way take word and deed out of there just the very thoughts condemn us before the Lord because not one of us can, can, can even control a thought. Everything that comes up, it's just like bad breath. It's just, it's, it's a stench before a holy God. So that's why this mitre, this headdress or turban, when you think of mitre, think of a turban, was engraved. It was on the head. It was engraved with a plate of gold on blue lace. And it was fastened on the front of the linen miter fastened on front, on the front of the forehead, but engraved with those words, holiness to the Lord. Before you ever think of approaching unto God, you can't get past his holiness and who he is as a just God. We shouldn't be surprised that he condemns sinners. We should be surprised that he saves sinners. But if he saves any sinner, it's going to be in a just way. He's just in his condemnation, but he doesn't lower his standard to save. It's got to be in a just way to save wretches such as we are. And that's what this mitre reminds us of. As those priests went in and they had this written on their forehead, holiness unto the Lord. 
it was a reminder that that was why that high priest was established, to answer to that holiness. In type, by the presentation of those blood sacrifices, but those animal sacrifices couldn't take away sin. That was all under God's forbearance in the Old Testament until Christ should come and fulfill it and put it away. This is what we see over in Revelation chapter 4. We talked about Christ coming and living and dying and rising again. Here in Revelation chapter 4, we have a view of this very Christ in glory. But because here it says that this would be on the forefront forever. Well, how can it be on the forefront forever, especially since the earthly priesthood now has been done away? Well, it's forever in who the high priest represented, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at here in Revelation chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. This is what John saw. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Isn't this exactly the view that Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6? And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That shows you right there that Christ is God. He was, has always been, He is, even now, and is to come. People talk about who's coming. That's a good question to ask. Everybody talking about Jesus coming again. Well, who is he? Here we see him being nothing but the, the prophet, priest, and king that God the Father established. And it says here in verse 9, When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, talks about these angels that night and day serve the Lord who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders. So you've got up there the four beasts that represent the angels around his throne but here the four and twenty elders these represent all of the Lord's redeemed ones whether in the Old or New Testament you've got twelve patriarchs in the Old Testament that represent his church in the Old Testament and you've got the twelve apostles of the New twelve and twelve equals twenty four that's why that number is significant and they fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. You notice there's none of this business of wearing crowns around in heaven. Like you hear people talking about as if somehow we strutting around like peacocks. No. These crowns that represent any glory that the Lord has given to his people. What do they do? They cast their crowns before the throne. Saying. There's only one crown. That's what this mitre represents. It's on the head of the high priest. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So that's the same picture that we see here of Christ in glory. That holy mitre ever being upon his head. And he is that high priest, the one who came to fulfill all things. The last item that we look at here then is in verse 39 and 40. It says, And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and what? Bonnets. Shalt thou make, what for? For them for glory and for beauty. That's what these represented. Just like the crown of glory and beauty being upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was a headpiece that these were to wear. These were coverings for the head. And of the same kind with the mitre of the high priest. Of the same length. And uh, these were for the sons of Aaron that... They, as high priests, should enter in and out, but for glory and beauty, to beautify and adorn him. I could preach a whole message on that. What is the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's his person. It's his work. Uh, we cannot say enough about who he is as 
the high priest, to set him apart. This wasn't something that you gave to your kids, uh, dress up in costumes. Hey, you want to try on a high priestly robe here, kiddies? No, this was reserved for those that the Lord had appointed in the Old Testament. And it's reserved for only one that God has appointed, and that is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of him be the glory. When we, wherever we sing that, all the glory and honor belong unto him. And if we have any acceptance at all before a holy God, it's only in him. Well, I hope that's helpful and brings us to worship Christ for who he is.